I wanted to come up with the perfect thing to say for today for our troubled world. And I found that my notes for today's talk were a blank page. There is no perfect thing to say for today's troubled world. There is no perfect thing to say at all. So last week we asked ourselves the question, what would I do? What would I do? What will we do? How will we enact our bodhisattva vows in this world as it is? And we talked about the tools that our practice gives us for showing up. That the way we will enact our bodhisattva vows in this world are no different than how we're showing up day to day. The week before that, we talked about staying present to the suffering all around us. And you might remember that the morning of October 7th, just before the morning program, I received a message from my friend in Israel telling me that one of her dearest friends was at that exact moment in her safe room, in her home, on her kibbutz, kibbutz Berry in southern Israel. And at that exact moment, she could hear terrorists on the other side of her door. And in that moment, all of us, wherever we are in the world, America, Canada, wherever, we did the thing that we know is the best option. We practiced loving kindness for her with everything that we have. Last week we heard a bit more of her story, the woman who was trapped, her name is Para. She got out after 48 hours. And she described to my friend, who described it to us, sitting there in her safe room, practicing loving kindness in her way. Sitting there, imagining herself surrounded by light, exactly as we were imagining her surrounded by light. As we practiced loving kindness for her and for the people near her, and all around her, including the people who wanted to kill her, that the hatred in their hearts might be dissolved with loving kindness, even just a tiny bit. She herself mirrored what we were doing by sitting there alone, disabled, afraid, and refusing to let her mind give in to the fear and the negativity, saying, I am okay. You are okay. I know you are good. I know you are good. You will not hurt me. I am protected. You do not want to hurt me. I am okay. In good, there is evil. In evil, there is good. I am protected. I am protected. There is goodness.
I don't want to ascribe any magical thinking. There may well have been others who were praying similarly who died. All I know is this one person met us and others because people were praying for her from around the world, met us with the same energy that we were offering to her, this energy of loving kindness without discrimination, and that she was okay. Many people considered her escape to be a miracle, and it was. It's a miracle that she's alive. And they asked her to talk about the miracle. She was interviewed on television, and she said the real miracle is the miracle of the beauty of the sky, of the grass, that I am alive, that I have the chance to embrace my daughter. Once again, this is a miracle. There are miracles everywhere. Everything is a miracle. This is the energy that we need to bring into this world around us right now with just as much urgency as we did three weeks ago. Just as much urgency, really. We cannot afford to let our hearts harden with hatred, to retreat from our own fear, to give in to fury and anger. We cannot afford this. The world around us cannot afford this, really. I can't afford this myself. You can't afford this. How? The question is how? How do we do this? How do we keep our hearts open in the face of so much terrible things, so many terrible things? We... We have to start where we start. Today, we practice loving kindness, starting with ourselves, but then directing loving kindness or metta practice to Israel and Gaza. And in doing so, I asked everyone to let loving kindness fall where your heart most feels it is needed without discrimination. And then from that place, wherever it is, whomever it is you're practicing for, then we very slowly expanded outwards, extended over the whole region, like moonlight, without discrimination. We have to start with our own pain point our own suffering and grow out from there. Or if we can't access our own pain point, find one person, one situation, one story and start there. But don't get stuck there, grow out. There was a show called um, Dairy Girls that came on during the pandemic. And it was about a group of mostly girls growing up in Northern Ireland during the Troubles. And one of the episodes, they are bused to a meeting with uh, the Catholics, are bused to a meeting with the Protestants. And they're supposed to you know, have some kind of teenage coming together 
moment and it's facilitated, you know, it's very orchestrated and facilitated and the facilitator stands in front of everybody with a chalk board and a piece of chalk and says, let's find the things that we have in common. And the girls, you know, and there are boys in the group too. They're like, they think about it. They're like, huh? Okay. Yeah, let's do this. Um, mm, Nope. Can't do it. They couldn't find even one thing, nothing. They just, nothing. You can see them, you know, on the show, they're all teenagers. So I can see something in common. They're all teenagers. There's a one thing for themselves. No, nothing. So then the show goes on and events happen. And at the end of the show, they do find something. Parents. They have in common difficulties with their parents. And that brings them together. This current situation is not a TV show. It's not a comedy, even a dark comedy. <laughs> but I realized this week, hearing two stories in particular where the commonality is. I think we all realize it. It's grief and sadness. I heard an interview with Rachel Goldberg, whose son Hirsch has been kidnapped. His arm was blown off by a grenade and he was taken hostage after that. She is a mom and she's doing everything she can possibly do to bring her son home. She's afraid. She doesn't know if her son, whom she loves dearly, her son, who's only 23 years old, her son, who himself is a peace activist, she doesn't know if he's alive or dead. So the interviewer asked her, what her days are like. And she said, working to bring home my son. And it's true in her home, she had operation of all kinds of people working around the clock to do everything they can. Even in her grief, doing this interview that I'm sure she did not want to do. Everything was to bring home her son. And the interviewer said, what do you, What's what do you need right now? And she said, I need my son sitting right here next to me on this couch. And the interviewer asked some other questions. What do you think about what's going on with the military response, the Israelis' mil- military's response? And this was before things had really escalated to the point that they are at today. And she said, um, I hope they can find my son. I hope that the bombs won't hurt my son. I hope that the military response won't hurt my son. And then they said, um, if you could speak to the people who kidnapped your son, what would you say to them? And she said, I wouldn't say anything to them. I need to hear from them. I need to know what's going on for them. Why did you do this to my son? And then they said, if you could speak to a 23-year-old living in Gaza, what would you say to them? And she paused. And she said, I would tell him to find my son, please. To help me bring him back. a mother in grief. Grief consumes us. As we all know, grief takes over. When we are grieving, our focus of our entire life is on our own grief. 
Grief shuts us down. Grief makes us lose sleep. Grief brings us to tears, to fury sometimes. Grief has so many components. This is a mother in grief speaking from grief. Grief makes us tired, exhausted. Grief could make us numb or check out. Grief has so many effects. Later, I heard a mother's voice and a father's voice speaking with their son. Their son was young and he had gone into Israel and killed people. Ten, he said, with his own hands. And he called his parents to tell them. And he was elated. And his parents said, Come back, please come home. His mom said, Come back, when are you coming home? His dad said, Get out of there, come home. What I heard in that recording was, yes, something beyond terrible. And also two parents who cared about their child, two parents who were beginning to understand in that very brief segment of a conversation that their child was not going to come home. And what they wanted more than anything was for him to come home. Grief. We are so sad when we see and hear these stories, these stories of so much suffering of people killed in their own homes, of people whose homes have been destroyed completely, people without enough food to eat or clean water to drink. These stories break our hearts. This is compassion. This is what it is to suffer alongside. And their grief is not our grief. We are here in this country. We are safe. Our own child has not been kidnapped. Our own child has not gone across the border into the country of Israel, never to return. We are here. We feel their sadness. It breaks our heart. And it is their grief, not ours. So our job is to care for people in their grief. Our job is to surround them with love and with care. In their grief, in their fear, in their uncertainty, and in their anger, because anger is, as I said before, a natural outcome of grief. One of many things people do, they become furious. Some people shut down. Some people need to do stuff. Some people just sit on the couch and cry whatever they are experiencing in their grief, 
is how their grief is manifesting. And the way we respond to that grief is a choice that we make. I encourage us to respond with compassion. A couple of weeks ago, my neighbor across the street lost his father suddenly. I felt so sad when I learned about it. It reminded me of when my own father died two years ago, almost on the same day. And yet, in this time, two years later, the need was to care for my neighbor. So I made him food and took it over, warm food. I remembered, based on my own experience, my own sadness, what might be helpful at this time. I offered to feed his cat while he went to the funeral, and he was grateful. I took him food. And I listened to his story, just listening, not talking about my own dad, was of course in my mind, but really listening to his story. This was his grief. And the best thing we can do for people who are grieving is to hear them, to care for them, to hear their stories, to ask, what's going on for you? Tell me your story. I will hear it. Outrage and fury at the situation that caused their grief does not help them in their grief. Compassion does. We do not know the solution. If there were a solution that could be known, to this ongoing, ongoing, ongoing hatred, difficulty, struggle, fighting, somebody would have thought of it already. So it's not our job to figure that out. It's our job to attend to the needs that are here right now, which are the human beings who are suffering to offer loving kindness for them, to wish that they may have clean water to drink, a safe place to sleep, food to eat. The teacher Pema Chodron talks about the near enemies of compassion. They are, first of all, pity. Pity puts us up and others down. Oh, you poor people over there. You poor thing. You obviously can't take care of yourself. So I'll just feel sorry for, me, for you from over here. And I might even get mad about it. It doesn't help them at all. Compassion is to suffer with together, to meet them where they are, not to look down on them. Pity says that adult human beings can't help but to commit violence. We can always help but to commit violence. We can choose not to. Pity infantilizes them and says they have no choice. Compassion hears their suffering, the things underneath that led to that happening. Pity is a near enemy of compassion. The second one she talks about is overwhelm. A feeling of, oh my God, this is too much. I feel helpless. I can't do this. I can't look at the news at all. I have to, I've, or look at it too much. This feeling of overwhelm. And we find that we can't do anything helpful, but just sort of melt down. It helps nobody. 
when we feel this feeling of, whoa, this is too much, we can come back into community with each other, back into heart with each other by hearing each other, by care. And we can start with one person at a time. Simply attending to one story at a time. In doing this, we can shift our own fear from, oh my God, what's going to happen to me, to how can I help you? Shifting our fear transforms a state of inaction or stuckness or overwhelm into something actually helpful. So overwhelm is also a near enemy of compassion. It prevents us from fully embodying just being with the people suffering. And the third thing that she mentions is idiot compassion, a kind of compassion that either goes along with everything and has no separation between me and them, as in the case I just spoke about, Oh my God, what's going to happen? Oh, I'm so, this is so terrible when it's not our grief. Or on the other side, completely avoiding any disagreement or conflict and just, uh uh uh-huh, uh-huh, having no sense of how we feel. This is idiot compassion. Again, How do we leave this just moving around with who, whatever everybody else is doing, jumping into this, well, all of my friends are, are going to this thing. So I better feel the same way as them. All of my friends are angry. I better feel angry too. All of my friends are protesting. I don't quite sure what, I'm not quite sure what we're protesting, but it seems important. So I'm going to go because I care. How about coming back into heart first? If we need to stand up and speak loudly, we can be sure that it comes from a place of heart. We can be sure that it comes from the Dharma. This is what our practice has to offer us. There's also a far enemy of compassion, and this is cruelty. We're seeing this now, even in our country, which is not at war, by the way. We're seeing a hardening, a hardening inside and a hardening into us and them. Choose a side. Which side will you choose? You better choose. It's important to choose a side. And then let's be loud about it. This hardening helps nobody. It brings us away from true compassion. Booker T. Washington once said, let no one pull you so low as to make you hate them. We can choose not to hate. After all, we are adult human beings. We can make our own decisions and choosing not to hate or to be pulled into hate by others is a choice we can make. I encourage all of us to make this choice now because our lives depend on it. Our lives here even, in this country where we are not at war, depend on it, depend on us coming into compassion to care for each other. The Zen teacher Harada Seke once said, there are many problems that cannot be resolved. Things in the world often get stuck within the confines of good and evil. 
correct or incorrect. Zen will come to nothing if it cannot go beyond these limits. Seek for something that transcends good and evil. Do not get stuck. On the morning of October 7th, we sat here together, having received the message that Parach was trapped in the safe room with terrorists just outside the door. And we practiced loving kindness for her with everything that we had. We understood the urgency of that moment. This feeling of, I would do anything for you if you could just be safe. Let's now bring that urgency to everyone, starting with her, spread out, just as we did on the seventh, spread out to the people around her, to the little kids who feel the sounds and the shaking of the bombs being dropped on their homes, spread out to the people who don't have enough food or water or who have lost their homes altogether, everywhere, spread out. Spreading loving kindness over the entire world without limit, above, below, and all around. The other day when I spoke with my friend, she told me she wanted to go and visit Para, and I didn't want her to. It's dangerous there, and she's not well. She has pain. Parak is now safe in a hotel near the Dead Sea, which they call the Salt Sea. And I said to my friend, you know, I don't, I don't want you to drive. It doesn't, I don't, it doesn't feel safe to me. And do you really have to go? And she said, the thing is, I want to. I, I bought things for her, things she would like, things that will make her get cheered up, you know, colorful things and funny things and some foods that she likes. And and I have money for her. You know, she lost everything. She has nothing left. I want to take her these things and some foods that she likes. And she said, mostly I just want to sit with her and talk with her and hear her story and let her know how much I love her. This is the way. This is the way to be in this. This is the way to heal the world. This is the way to bring our practice to everyone without limit. Spreading loving kindness over the entire world like moonlight leaving out no one. We can do this together. Thank you.